Hey, Juice, the only thing better than looking clean is looking clean on your own time. No doubt about it, Big Seth, and that's why I always call my man Ara at a t Dry Cleaners anytime I need my clothes laundered or dry cleaned. Tell him exactly why you call Ara. Because a t offers free pickup and delivery at your home or office, so you've never had the inconvenience of trying to find time to take your dry cleaning somewhere. They bring it to you. That's exactly right, Juice. You can walk into their Fort Lauderdale location, but a t serves Miami-Dade, Broward, and the Southern Palm Beaches with their convenient pickup and delivery services, which also include alterations, shoe repair, and more. And A&T is a family-owned company, and they've been in business since 1980. 1980. Yeah, and you know what? That means customer service is their priority. So call Ara today at 954-610-9383. That's his personal cell we're giving you. Or you can visit drycleanertoyou.com to start making your life and your dry cleaning a lot easier. And make sure you tell them that the fish tank sent you, because Ara, my man, is giving our listeners 50% off your first order. How much? 50. Half. Seth. Half and 25% off any dry cleaning services after that. ANT Dry Cleaning, the official dry cleaners of the fish tank. You're now diving into the fish tank. Sitting down with Seth Living, Seth. OJ, Juice, Juice Man, ooh, and this is strictly for them true fans, yeah. dog fans, number one, one, of course y'all, this ain't no ordinary sports talk, dive up in that fish tank. Welcome back to the Fish Tank, Seth Levitt, with none other than O.J. McDuffie and Juice. We are killing it at Shula's Hotel and Golf Club for Dolphins Alumni Weekend. Big Seth, big weekend, big guest. Big time stuff, man. It's it's been a lot of fun, man. And you know, for guys like myself, it's always fun to hang out with the, the former players because we have so much fun stuff to talk about. And uh, you know, the stories are amazing, but the people themselves, man, get to know some guys. It's, it's even more amazing. So that doesn't that, that doesn't change with our next guest. No, that that's for sure. And you know, it's been cool. We've interviewed a few guys, guys I've worked with in some capacity. But our next guest is a guy that I got to cheer for as a kid. I that I rooted for. I've never I've just met him for the first time ever. But I am pumped that William Judson dives into the tank. William, welcome, man. Oh, I'm glad to be here, and thanks for inviting me. He's actually been in the tank before. And we'll talk about that a little later, but we just didn't know he was in the tank. Right, well, that's he true. Was, he was referenced in the tank. He, he was secretly in the tank, he, but that's been revealed. We'll talk about that a little later. That's yeah. been revealed. So we're just, you know, we're just going to jump right in, William. So eighth round pick, which is, you know, even that alone, when you think about now with only seven rounds in, in the modern NFL draft, but eighth round pick in 1981, and then you end up on a defense that features the killer bees. So my first question, I was getting prepped for this. My first question was like, how pissed off were you that your name didn't start with B, man? <laughs> well, actually, you know, I felt pretty good uh, because it kind of like, made you stand out a little bit. Yeah, that's uh, fair. Myself and uh, Paul Langford or Don McNeil, whomever was starting at that time on the other side, were the only – uh, members of that defense, the starting defense, that last name then began with a B. So, <laughs> but you know they got a little marketing dollars out of that, or but you like that because they, did they all just get lumped in together as the Killer Bees? Well, but you got well, to be William Judson. Just just lumped in, and as a matter of fact, they made the posters, and we were never on the posters. You know, uh, last name then began with B, but that's okay. You know, it was a part of the Killer B defense. Well, at this point now, you're probably glad you're not in those posters because they look <laughs> pretty silly. In those. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw one yesterday at the golf course. You know with the little stinger. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Guys are hanging yeah, in the air. Yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> I mean, you. I mean, let's talk about before you even got to the Dolphins. You, you, know, you played college ball at Illinois and Fam, right? No, 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 no. That's my son. Your son's it. Your son's it. Yeah, yeah, son. yeah. yeah. receiver, son, right? Yeah. My son played receiver. receiver. He played Fam here yeah, in Denver's Illinois. Well, I went right. to I'm South. A, I went to South Carolina State. I see that now. I'm okay. looking at the wrong there information. We yeah, but we got the same name. You're corner so. though, corner. and he's a wide receiver. How'd that happen? Who has better hands? Well, you know, I mean, you play if you're playing DB. You probably yeah, yeah. He had better hands. He's a little faster, a little quicker. So you know, I get yeah, hey. <laughs> Pass that seat on there. <laughs> my my son has way better hands than me too. Wind's a little bigger than what the corners typically look like these days, man. Well, you know, even back then, I was kind of tall for a corner, sort of lanky, which. Most of the corners were, you know, five ten ish, five nine. You know, look quicker feet, but uh, I was able to stay stay with him. I kind of, you know, I kind of patterned myself after like Mel Blunt. You know, he was a big guy. He was bigger than me, but he was somebody that kind of physical with the uh, receivers on the line. And because uh, I feel like I can get my hands on you, 
then I can run with you. Because I had pretty good speed. I had. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think he's speed. underestimating that, so, son. You know. I think yeah. he's underestimating his <laughs> speed. Because I know in your second year, we drafted Mark Duper. Right. And uh, I, I understand and that. There's a guy you know, who we run. know how fast Duper was. Right. But you can hold your own. I know you can yeah. hold your own. Okay. Talk about it. I think there was an episode where you guys actually had a, had a race. Well, you know, Duper uh, came in. And they say, oh, this guy runs a 4.28. I said, 4.28? I said, I don't believe that. You know, never seen anybody run a 4.28, especially on grass, you know. So Duper came in. He looked pretty fast. And, you know, we kind of talked and kind of uh, started hanging out with each other. And he told me he was a track guy. He didn't play football in high school. Uh, but for a track guy, he had great hands, soft hands. And I was wondering, because most track guys, and I've run, run up against like uh, – Say I played against uh, Willie Gold and mm -hmm. Ronaldo Neymar. Yeah, yeah, those wow. guys were track guys, but they weren't really. Uh, they, they were track guys. They were track. Guys. <laughs> they weren't right. physical. Right. They, they, right. They, the hands and were right. all right. Yeah. So Duper had the softest hands I'd ever seen. So I just remember one day because uh, we had the walkthroughs and uh, we, I think we were getting ready to go to. Um, Go to, go on the way trip. So, no, I, I think it was the day before. I think it was the Friday kind of combination day where it was combination uh, offense and defense. And so after practice, we decided we're going to run a race because we were talking about who were the fastest and that sort of thing. And I just said, you know what? I believe that I'm very quick and I can run with just about anybody in a 40-yard dash. Now, we're running 100 or 200 or something. <laughs> Might I start to fall be, off a little yeah, bit. start to fall off. <laughs> But I can run with anybody, in the, you know, and I say it's a 40 yards. How bad can somebody beat you in a 40? You don't want them to beat you anyway. So it was offense versus defense. We had a crowd there. And everybody was on offense cheering for Duke, defense cheering for me. <laughs> so, you know, it was bragging rights. So we took off. Maybe a little money somewhere, we, a little we, side we, bet. It, it could have been a little side <laughs> bet. So we took off. And uh, I forgot, it might have been Kozlowski or somebody started it. It could have been Nat Moore. So we had some guys at the starting line, some guys at the finish line. And uh, we took off. And I tell you, I got out of blocks fast, and Duke was fast too. And we got to the finish line, and I nipped him. You know, I I, I I bent at the finish line. and You went track guy on him. I went tra track guy on him. <laughs> now, what, you know, some people said it was me. A few people said it was Duke. but uh, I got to go majority. Hey, the majority said it was me. Well, and, they were probably trying just, to protect their just, bet. <laughs> it, was, it was so funny. And, but the bad thing about it was that Duke pulls a hamstring. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine so, that. Oh, so Shula, <laughs> you know, he was kind of standing in the background, and he saw it, and, and Duke pulled his hamstring, and he was trying not to limp, that sort of thing. And, uh, man, Dupe, uh, Shula let Dupe have it. So Shula called me into his office along with Dupe and said, what the hell are you guys out there doing? <laughs> I said, cool, we're just racing, that sort of thing. And at that time, Dupe was not a start. He wasn't even playing. Oh, that's so right, because he, he almost basically his first year. His first year, sad. he wasn't playing any special teams. And I said, "How's you know, <laughs> I know he's a second-round draft choice. <laughs> he's not starting. He's not, on, he not getting in on third down. He's not playing special team. He's not even going down running on kickoffs or nothing. <laughs> but he was just that fast, and they knew he was, you know, going to be good one day. So I said, Coach, we were just racing, and, you know, he said, well, who won the damn race? I said, I won, Coach. So he said, okay, get out of here. Ah, that's <laughs> you know, what's so, up. That's so what's it was, up. It was I love a good that. Race. He wants to know who yeah. won the race. And that's good, though, because yeah. if they drafted Duke on speed, right. you know, on hands, and right. they know you can run with him, that's, right. that's, that was big mm -hmm. for you. Yep. Contract negotiations, I would hope. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, that was my uh, – that was my second year, so that was Duke's first. I still wasn't starting. I came in on the nickel mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, kind of back up, but I played a lot of special teams. So when you were playing in nickel, were you playing inside or outside of nickel? I was playing inside. Uh -huh. That's, that's and, a tough position. Uh, in yeah, there. yeah. I was playing, but I wasn't in the slot. They had me. It was like dime, actually. Right. So I came in, and I was covering the best running back or the best somebody out of the right. backfield. Right. could have been a tight end. I remember – when we were playing uh, San Diego uh, in the playoffs, 
and they had me covering. I don't know if you guys remember a guy, Chuck Muncy. Absolutely. Oh, sure. man, he was a uh, – The Rex Bex, Oh, man. yeah, he yeah. was huge, and he was catching ball out the backfield, and I was on him. So, you know, guys like that, I didn't worry about them because I knew they weren't going to run by me and that sort of thing. I would be all over them. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, I understand that, yeah. That's, That's awesome. Up, so, speaking of Duper, and, and just like you said, get in there, 81. Duke comes in at 82. 83, mm-hmm. they bring in another uh, couple of guys that are pretty good on the mm-hmm. offensive side of the ball, Dan Marino okay. and Mark Clayton. Mm-hmm. And, like, almost overnight, mm-hmm. there's a transformation uh, on that offense. Right. And uh, talk about what that was like for a guy on the defensive side of the ball. What did you kind of witness happen before you with those guys? Well, I just remember, I think Clayton might have been drafted in the eighth round, too. I remember him coming in, and a lot of times, you know, we had pretty decent receivers, although we didn't pass the ball that much. I, I thought it would be hard for somebody like that to make the team uh, because if you're getting drafted in the eighth round, let's just face it, you know, it's a 12 round draft. Uh, you're basically, you know, a long shot to make the team. But you overcame you know? the odds. Yeah, I overcame the odds. And, you know, and, and I was happy about that. But the thing about it was when Clayton came in, you just knew he wasn't that fast. He was very quick, but he kept making all these acrobatic catches in practice. So athletic. Man. I mean, you know, in practice, He was diving and all kind of stuff. And, you know, we didn't really dive in practice, you know, but he was diving, laying out. And I said, oh, this guy's pretty good. And so he ended up making the team and, you know, he and you know, you know, the rest of the story. Well, we we had we had Clayton in the tank and he he was kind of pissed off that he. You know, he didn't get drafted a little sooner. Right. You know what I mean? He so thought he, he was he going was out, in the first round. He was out right. to prove something. <laughs> right, He right. was definitely out to prove right. something. You right. saw that firsthand. Oh, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. He came and he did his thing, and um, and he made the team. Reno, you know, throwing that ball. And, uh, man, he was just a, a great athlete. You can see that. What kind of how, – how much fun was that and how much – Good work you guys get going against each other every day, so daily practice, wondering. in and out. You know, yeah. that's that. Sometimes I talk about, you know, my best work was in practice against yeah. some of the DBs I had to go against. Oh, well, a- absolutely. And uh, Duper and Clayton, we talked about that yesterday on the way to the golf tournament, how they said that we made them better and they certainly made us better. And uh, even going up against Marino every day. Yeah. That quick release, you know, it, it was just it just had you prepared for the game. So I just remember saying, man, because my last year I, I went to Detroit and I played and I think Rodney Pete was the quarterback. Oh, wow. There was such a big difference in the ball yeah. coming out of Dan's hand and, and Rodney Pete's hand. And I was overplaying all over the guys, cheating, <laughs> you know, because I knew the ball wasn't going to get there yeah, like it did. But yeah, so yeah. it was. It was a big difference. Yeah, was there like a moment where you're sitting around, whether it's in a defensive meeting room or you're just on the on the sidelines in practice or whatever, and you're talking to Paul or whoever, and you're like, Man, this, this is a different kind of thing that's <laughs> happening right now. Like, did you did you know that something was about to change? Cause it, With, I mean, Reno? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, you could see it in practice. But then again, you know, practice is – no rush. You better not touch the quarterback, that sort of thing. Definitely not touch him. So, no, you can't touch him. And, uh, you know, because we had David Woodley at that time and, and we had Don Strzok was a backup. And you see him going through the stuff. and But you wonder what could happen in the game. And it's just amazing how I remember one game, uh, lackluster play, and I can't remember. They put Marino in there. And he almost brought us back. And he was just throwing the ball. And I just said, wow. I said, <laughs> this stuff is really happening. You know, it, you know, you see it in practice, but you don't think it's going to happen in the game. And getting in the game, and that stuff was just, like, natural. So it was – he was just – you know, the offense was changing because Shula really was a ground-and-pound type of coach. David Woodley wasn't much of a passer. You know, we had um, – you know, some running backs, and they practiced run blocking most of the time. So when it was come time to pass block, you know, that was a little little shaky a little bit right. because we didn't practice on it that much. So, <laughs> hey. That is – that's funny. You, you talked a little bit about Shula. You, you, mm-hmm. you know, you talked about just about the race. What else can you tell me about Coach? We, you know, when I got Coach, he was more mellow. We talked to some guys from the 70s when it was four-day practices. Mm-hmm. You kind of had caught him in between all that. Tell, right. Talk about your time with Black from training well, camp and, and the way he approached everything. Yeah. Well, I couldn't believe, you know, you as a kid growing up and in college, uh, we'd watch – and you see the great Don Shula. It was Don Shula, Tom Landry, those guys. And so I said, man, I'm going to play for Don Shula. So we, you know, went down to training camp. 
And it was unbelievable that when we went out for practice in minicamp, Shula would lead us out running and doing the exercises. Wow. And I said, wow, you know, this coach is doing it. And so, you know, he, he it, it was just incredible to see the great Don Shula out there uh, leading us in the exercise. And some of the other things that went on that amazed me, not only about Shula, but about the National Football League. When I came into the National Football League, I thought to myself, uh, you know, because I, I had already been been raised in Little League football, high school football. All of my coaches were black. I had never had a white coach in my life. So uh, I was brought up very, you know, respectful. And you know, some of the times, you know, coaches put hands on me. You know, <laughs> right. you're not – hey, and so it was very different. So I went to South Carolina State. It was all black. All of my coaches were black. So I, when I get to Miami, uh, things were a little bit different because – Growing up until I got to the Dolphins, everything was yes, sir, no, sir, this kind of thing. So when I got to the Dolphins and they, you know, give me a coaching point, make a correction, I said, yes, sir, yes, sir. And I remember some of the guys, I remember in particular this guy, Mike Kozlowski, he uh-huh. came up, he said, man, he said, not a yes, sir, no, sir stuff doesn't go here. You know, why are you saying it? And so I said, hey, that's just the way I was. And, it, and so wow. I can remember during the games one time, Shula was cussing Mike Koslowski <laughs> out. He and, probably could have used his yes, sir. And Mike Koslowski was cursing him back out. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what? I, I walked away. I said, man, you know, this is, this is crazy. He's cussing the coach out. But what I found out was this. Shula seemed to be in another zone mm. during the game. So he would cuss you out and re- stuff that would make me hold a grudge for weeks if if he had said that to me. So he cussed cars out that game, cars cussed him back out, and then after the game they laughing and joking and, and that kind <laughs> like, of. What the and so I said, "What's what's going on?" Crazy ass white so, people over here. So, so I remember. <laughs> so I just remember he saying, that one. and then and then in practice, <laughs> some things happened. Shula would cuss out the player. The player would cuss back at him. And, and and another thing that happened that I couldn't believe, everybody called the coaches by their first, first names. names. Yeah, I was Coach Shula, Coach Keen, Coach, you know Sandusky, all of those, you know, coaches. They said, uh, and so they called them by the first name. And I'm saying, wow, that's just I I, I can't do that. <laughs> and but I did find this out, and you know, it kind of changed me a little bit. The guys that cursed back at them. Shula backed off. They backed off. Mm. But with me saying, yes, sir, no, he would stay on. Still in your ass like a rock I said, well, <laughs> you know what? Maybe I need to curse a little <laughs> right, bit. Right, right. You know, I never did get used to that, but that was But one did you thing ever do it? Was there that moment where you broke through? And like, I never well, cursed a coach. I never cursed. But I don't care if they cursed at me, which, you know, was kind of rare. But if they really fussed at me, I never talked back to them or anything. It was always, yes, sir, no, sir. Ben, that's just the way I was raised. Yeah, I, I remember the first time I heard that type of language because I, you know, I went to Penn State <laughs> right. and we call our coaches by the first name, but there were no, Joe, you say, no four letter words. Like, right. you know, no cursing whatsoever. Right. Coaches wow. didn't curse, players weren't allowed right. to curse. But when I heard Danny <laughs> cursing in the meeting at, at our offensive coordinator, Right. I was like, what the hell? What did I get myself into? What, <laughs> right, what right, world is this? Right, I've right, never, right. like you talk about, growing up, of course, when you're, you know, you're a kid in Pee Wee, you don't curse. Mm-hmm. You know, junior high, high school, you don't curse those right, coaches. But right. in college, you got a chance you might curse. We didn't have that at Penn State. But right. when I first got here, I mean, that was some grown men shit, like, all the I, time. I, like, I, I said, this is this is the, the NFL. That's the way it was. I mean, I couldn't believe it. So I had to get used to that. Right. You know, so. Right. And Yeah, and yeah I, I get it. I get it, man. You, you're a gentleman, nice right. guy. And then you got to, like, all right, and now you got to take that up. You got to be a little hard ass a little bit sometimes. Right. Oh, well, yeah. Well, it you, sounds like you, you got used respect. to it, but you didn't dive into that. You didn't dive into that, you didn't, didn't, no, no, that part. No, I, that, I, he didn't I go to that did. side of it. I never did. Good for you, man. And I tell you guys another story that – was very interesting to me okay now when i got drafted in the eighth round i had to get you know at south carolina state we had a very it was a country town orangeburg south carolina you know it was very small so we didn't have to worry about the media that kind of stuff so i get here and you know the miami Herald, you got a beat writer somebody's out there every day and and i just remember uh reading Articles, because I used to read, see what do they think about me, and that sort of thing. Because you know the coaches don't tell you anything. Right? Do I have a shot? I said, look, seem like I'm doing well, but do I have a shot? And I remember they would 
trying to project the roster. And I read an article, and that article said, well, William Justin's doing very well out here, but he's probably not going to make the team. He probably, oh, man. He's probably going to be um, you know, a good practice player, but he, he probably won't make it. And mentally, for about a day, that messed with me. But then I said, you know what? Let me let me just not focus on that. Let me just concentrate uh, because the odds I felt like were already against me because I knew that on the it was a forty five man roster at that time, mm. and the Dolphins were keeping traditionally they'll keep seven DBs. Right. So you did some maybe research. Maybe eight, seven, maybe eight DBs if you're lucky. All right. Well, they had eight guys coming back from last year. <laughs> I said, and all of them made the team last year, and they drafted Fulton Walker, oh, a Fulton defensive Walker. back, yeah. in the sixth round. He was a return guy. They drafted him to be the return specialist. Return but, he, but he was a cornerback. So he was going to count as one of those DBs. Yeah, for sure. So now that's nine. Okay, and then here I am in eighth round as a tenth one. So I said, how in the world am I going to make it? So I just put my nose down to the grind and – and I and, and I just worked hard. And, and once I got to the NFL and coming from South Carolina State, I said to myself, these guys are really no better than me. Yep. You know, they put their pants on just like – because I got out there and we ran those first – uh, at mini camp, we ran drills. How about those conditioning? How about the oh, conditioning yeah. stuff? Twelve yeah. minute run, yeah. all of that kind of stuff. <laughs> and uh, and see, the twelve minute run was something that everybody dreaded. Oh, talk about the twelve right. minute run. Got to do that. Got to make it seven laps around. We were at Both St. Fields, Thomas. Yeah. Were you at St. Yeah, Thomas? Yeah, for one, that, okay. for the twelve minute run. Okay. first one. Yeah. Okay, twelve minute. You got to run seven times around the field. Well, at South Carolina State, we ran a twelve minute run every Sunday. Right. Oh wow! Every Sunday, so it got to the point where running. 12 minutes, I could almost do it backwards. Nothing. So, and then we got, and they were doing gassers, and the times for the gassers were, I think, for, it might have been 48 seconds or something like that. Well, we ran them at South Carolina State, it was 45 seconds. Right. So I said, wow. I said, if these older guys, 30 years old, if they can make it, I can make it. And so it really, really gave me confidence. The thing, the difference between at South Carolina State and when I got to uh, the Dolphins was this. Everything was timing. Everything was timing. So I would have wide receivers covered you know, And when I played in college. And the ball might be underthrown a little bit, and I'd make the interception, knock it down. But when I got here, the receivers didn't seem – I said they were no faster than anybody else, but they ran precise routes, the patterns, the timing – Ball was coming out of the quarterback's hand before he left, and I would be right on the receipt. I said, well, I got him covered and just barely missed it, and he catch. I said, what in the world's going on? That's, so that's a big yeah, the difference. difference right there. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the timing and the, the timing. little windows. and you know the windows. That, the ball and, has to be gone. And another thing, too, was at South Carolina State, believe it or not, we never uh, filmed practice. Never. Ever. They didn't film practice? We just, the only film we saw was game, game time. time. Huh? Wow. And it was one view. It, it was no, <laughs> it was no, no sideline end zone. No, no, oh, no, no. It was one view. I mean, we get to, I get to Miami. They're filming practice. I'm saying, oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, and they zoom in one on one, Drew, just you and the oh, receiver. Oh, man. And so you can see the little missteps you're making and the little false steps and, and the inches that if you can improve this and improve that, then you can become better. So I saw, so that helped me a whole lot. And I saw, I know that the guys came from the schools like the Penn State, the Alabama. They were used to that kind of stuff. I, I mean, and I wasn't. I wasn't used to the crowd. Right. The largest crowd I'd ever played for at South Carolina State was maybe 15,000 people. Homecoming, it's packed. I said, oh, man, we, we excited. It's packed. <laughs> yeah. And then we'd go play a classic. Like, I remember we played at the old Meadowlands, New York Giants Stadium. And we played a classic. And they have maybe 10, 15. It looked like it's nobody in there. Right. You can hear echoes. <laughs> so my first preseason game was against the Minnesota Vikings up in Minnesota. We played at the old Metropolitan Stadium. The Twins and the Vikings played on the same. So it was during the preseason. You got the baseball field and all yep. of that out there. You know, so I'm going in right after halftime. Okay, Justin, you're in there. And – 
quarterback, some old timers, Tommy Kramer. They had Amara Tommy Rashad, Kramer. and those guys were getting ready to. I said, "Oh my God!" They were still in there. They put me in there, and, and as a matter of fact, they said, "You're going in next possession." Well, the next possession, they had in, intercepted the ball. And they were on our twenty yard line. Oh, they're getting ready to score, so they put me in there. No and, pressure. Oh man, so it was something, and I remember. You know, but, you know, everything worked out well. I think I knocked down a ball, almost slipped on the dirt. But I said, you know, that no excuse. If you slip and fall, hey, this could be it That's for you. right. Uh, it, it was just fun. You know, it was just an eye-opening. You know, I remember walking out there, and I'm looking and touching the grass, and making sure nobody saw me. I said, man, this is the <laughs> NFL. Look at this. On three yards per carry, Chris Kaufman had enough. They turned 26% of the roster – days before the game i mean it's it's absolutely i've yeah, never seen anything like that i've, I've well, never seen anything something. like that before and trust me you haven't seen anything like that you listener you have not seen anything like that either and no. anybody who says oh this is the patriot way this is what they do no that's bullshit that is not true that is not something that the nfl does it is not something you've ever seen before it's not something you've seen in new england no it's not somewhere something you've seen anywhere else so don't let brian flores pull the wool over your eyes and say you know oh turnover and the nfl happens turn over you know blah 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 no bullshit that's bullshit folks okay that is a lie okay you yeah. know they turned over 26 percent of the roster days before the season began and that had a drastic effect on the outcome of this game download subscribe and listen to us on your favorite podcast provider i yeah. want to circle back to something you right. said about st thomas man you mm-hmm. talk about the one-on-ones that was the most nerve-wracking thing for me because mm-hmm. for one all the fans are like right there mm-hmm. he said that zeroing in on it's that one-on-one opportunity right. out there right i mean how how tough was that because i know for me that was the the worst practice i ever had right. my first mini camp uh-huh. at st thomas when i'm going against guys like Troy vincent and uh-huh. jb brown right and all eyes are on me, the rookie. Right. You know what I mean? Right. How was that? Who was who were we out there going against most of the time on one on ones? Or were you well, in the back trying to, you know, go against No. You no, no, no. up front going against the top tier guys. No, it just so happened that my little mind coming out of South Carolina State was thinking that if I was faster than these guys, nobody was gonna beat me. I I was worried about getting, you know, getting beat deep for a touchdown. So none of the receivers they had, it was Nat Moore was, you know, he was getting older, but he was still a really good receiver. Jimmy Cephalo, they had uh, Durio Harris. They had some guys like that. I knew they could never outrun me. So I would always try to jump up and be first, even though some of the veteran corners wouldn't let me. But I would always try because my thing was, okay, I'm an eighth-round draft choice. I got to do something that's going to open somebody's right? eyes. Mm-hmm. So I get up against them, and if they will beat me, it'll be like on, on an out or a quick slant, and I'm right there to make the play. So I never was really nervous about that. Uh, my, I guess the most nerve-wracking thing was we used to do goal line passing. Now, goal line passing, is it going to be a touchdown or incompletion? And that was very quick, and, and that's the sort of thing where – if they you you you've got to be on them if right. they run something quick, and also touchdown, you know. So that was the most nerve wracking thing. We had our best little times doing goal line passes. Yeah, that's that's a fun time. What do you think your uh, your favorite season was with the Dolphins at that point? My favorite season was probably uh, uh, either my first season starting, or either the season we went to the Super Bowl and lost in '84 when we lost to the 49ers mm-hmm. when Marino was quarterback. And then my first season starting the way that I was able to start uh Don McNeil towards Achilles tendon in, in in the preseason and so he was out for the year and it was going to be me or Fulton Walker and I said well oh the, the sixth round pick yeah the six, <laughs> sixth round pick. but he was <laughs> already yeah but, yeah but yeah. this this was the third it was our third yeah, year right, that was right, 81 right. it was our right. third year and I already knew that you know I was pretty good corner he was the return guy right so they naturally they gave him the first shot and you know, he, he did okay. Uh, but when I got in there, I did a, a really good job. And I just remember uh, the last preseason game against the Giants, and it was already a f- foregone conclusion. Because, see, back then, even the last preseason game, we played a little bit. It was none of this like today where you don't <laughs> even dress. Unbelievable. <laughs> you know, we played. And so, well, we might have played, you know, a quarter or something like that. And uh, so – I knew that I was going to be starting. Well, the last series, I kind of tweaked my hamstring. Oh, boy. And I said, oh, my gosh, I don't want to start in position, but I'm not healthy. Right. 
and we were going up against the Buffalo Bills. They had Joe Ferguson. They had uh, oh man, they had some some uh, Jerry Butler. They had some some receivers that were really really good. And I remember the whole week they had an article and they had a cartoon. Somebody drew a cartoon with my number and a bullseye. Oh it. boy! <laughs> and so yeah, that was that we got to get you to stop <laughs> reading oh, yeah. the papers, Well, They, we gotta, they, they, they said leave that, those hey, papers alone. You know he he's gonna be the Bills' target. And they came at me and came at me, and I performed very well. Didn't get any inception, but they knew at that time that I was going to be pretty good. And later on during that year, I guess three or four games later, I had probably one of my best games when I, uh, at that time, it was an NFL record. It may not be now, but intercepted the Jets three times in one quarter. Damn. And that, that was has uh, to be a record. So that, that was be, yeah. they maybe needed time. to find another yeah. bullseye. At yeah, that yeah, point. yeah. So so then you know, so Three that was times my first in one quarter. Yeah, so I, I they were a lot of teams were trying to go after me and that sort of thing, but then uh they end up going at the other corner then after that. So uh, yeah. <laughs> send that somewhere else. Good yep. stuff. You know, your rookie year was eighty one. Of course in eighty two mm-hmm. was a strike year. Right. And then five years later in eighty seven there's a potential for yeah, right. for another face another what was your role in, in that whole process? And, you know, how challenging was that whole experience being out there and, and you well, know, having to, you know, strike and, and you know, for, for for the reason you guys are striking? Well, let, let, let me – back in 82, that was my second year. That was my actually first year because the first year in 81 I was on injury reserve. Okay. But 82, uh, I made the team, uh, had a tremendous mini camp. Uh, before that season, but I made the team and I felt pretty good about it. Now we're going to go on strike. Okay, my gosh, we're going on strike. And I remember Shula, uh, the, well, the, the the NFL PA said that we're going to show some solidarity and we want both teams to meet at mid, midfield and shake hands. And Shula said, I ain't having none of that shit. Y'all, I control <laughs> this team. Y'all are not going to do that. And so, you know, we were nervous. And I said, dang, I just made the team. I don't want to do that. You know, nothing against Shula. And so I can't remember. But I think it was Cephalo was our uh, player rep. And uh, he said, guys, what do you guys want to do? Shula said, we better not shake hands. And so we said, you know, hey. A lot of the guys say, forget it. We got to do it. And so he can't cut all of them. So what we decided to do was to go ahead and shake hands at midfield. The entire team. The entire team. Now, there were seven guys that said, I'm not doing it. One of the guys was Kuchenberg. You know, he was kind of like against the union, but all the rest of them were kind of unruly. He said, I ain't ain't going. I don't believe in that. So they had an aerial view at – they took an aerial view, a shot of the entire field, and you can see everybody's numbers that went out and shook hands. Oh, boy. And so we went ahead and we shook hands, and Shula was growling, standing over there looking – after the game, the next – when we came back for, to watch the film, all of the guys that did not shake hands, he cut them. Wow. He cut them. Are you serious? The guys he who did them. not shake no, he hands. Did, did not, except Kuchenberg. Right, now, Kuchenberg, you know, he didn't he, – but everybody else, he cut. And so he had a team, and he said, guys, I was kind of just testing you guys. He said, I would rather for you guys to work as a team – than to listen to anybody to try to tell you to do something that you didn't be, that you believed in, and I gained a lot of respect wow. for him because because I was one of those that's, guys that's saying shit. Awesome. I say, should I not go shake hands? Right. I'm just a I mean, young guy. I just that. made the I mean, team. Imagine that if you just I went back. I went ahead. He cut them all. Wow. So that was '87. So if you had made one I'm different decision, I mean that's almost a coin flip. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so in '87, then I became the player rep. At that time, I was playing well, and and around the league in 82, uh, nobody really wanted the player reps' jobs. So what the teams were doing, they were cutting the player reps. If you're the player rep, they're going to cut you. So they want to cut the snake out by the head and, and try to defeat the union. Well, we got Crazy. a little smarter, so we said, okay, well, we'll put some guys that are kind of important to the team as the player reps. So they elected me. You know, I was one of the you know, leaders on defense. And my assistant was Dan Marino. Right. Okay. So now, <laughs> wow. now, dude, that was yeah. Yeah. So, so now he yeah, was so, safe. We know so, that. So so we went 
And uh, I just remember <laughs> my uh, assistant was Dan Marino. Yeah. That's yeah. the name of this episode, by the way. <laughs> I, I remember, uh, you know, just us and guys going out on strike, and and some of the guys uh, were not striking. And no, I mean, some of the guys that were striking, their wives said, "You better get out there because we losing yeah, this money. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah. We losing this money. That's a tough so deal. some of the guys were coming in break, but we kind of held them, held them back. In eighty seven is when they did the scab, the scab. Season, they had the right? scab games, and man, and and when those guys, a couple of them came and tr- were trying to make the team, they were just ostracized, just put to the side. You're gonna kind of cross our picket line. So. so you guys are outside this outside training camp, but the facility with right. signs, with signs striking, and remember, t-shirts, yeah, striking t-shirts. and. And, uh, and, and some guy. of these guys were just crossing the line. So it was just, it was unbelievable. Man, oh, man, that's, yeah. that's a tough deal right there. Yep. I mean, that has to be a tough deal. I mean, guys now, they have it a lot easier. I think they, <laughs> you know, they keep getting these deals done in advance. I think right. there's another one that's up in, two, in 2020. It's a lot right? more money to leave on the money. table. Yeah, yeah. exactly, game. right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's tough for the guys that are making a little bit of money when you got the guys mm-hmm. making a lot of money. They can, they can actually sit mm-hmm. out a little while. But the other right. guys that like you talk about well, have that point. family pressure. Well, let me tell you about money. This that's another thing I want to talk about. Uh, the salaries are so different now than it was then. Mm-hmm. I was an eighth round draft choice, and uh, I had a signing bonus of ten thousand dollars. <laughs> okay, nice. And I had a three year three year contract: thirty seven five, forty five. And fifty seven five. Wow. Thirty seven five, forty five, and fifty seven five. And what would you sign a bonus? Ten thousand. Ten thousand. Okay. $10, now, and I gave all the ten thousand dollars to my mother. I said, you know, it was it was seven something when they took out taxes, and man, I was so happy to be playing in the National Football League. I was making thirty seven five. So happy. Touching the grass. And and I remember my fourth year, I renegotiated my contract. My fourth year. And uh, at that particular time, I made 105. I said, "Man, I've arrived." Yeah, six making figures. six figures. Yeah, six figures. I'm making a hundred grand. And uh, by the time I my last year, uh, I was making like 325. And I said, "Man, this is you know, this is this is the life." But now I think these guys, man. Boy. <laughs> Unbelievable. Boy. Rookie minimums Boy. more than you know. that now. Well, but yeah. you know what? And yeah. it's and I think it gets lost on guys today. Um, and it, well, like it would be uh, not to criticize guys today, but just when you're in the moment, you don't mm-hmm. have the perspective that someone right. has that has lived it. Right. But like you know, Preach just pulled up that that picture of the picket lines. Mm-hmm. It's those moments that you guys had standing out there exactly giving right. up yeah. money right. that that ultimately allowed guys to make the money that they make mm-hmm. now. To have you the know power that sacrifice that yeah. was made. Yeah. yeah, you guys that you guys had to take that that beating in some and and yeah. take a stand to for them to get that. Leverage. And 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 I hope that they can 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 remember that when they're negotiating because we I remember when we were negotiating uh, the older guys the Zonkas the Greasies they used to kind of. You know, nudge us a little bit, and we did what we could. We went out on strike and did those things. But uh, hopefully, the guys now, because our pension, you know, as OJ knows, I mean, it, it is it is far inadequate compared to the other major sports. So hopefully, they can do something and, you know, help some of the guys who help the uh, create the league. Yeah. yeah, and you know what? There's only I think there what there were only two strike years, right? Mm-hmm. Eighty two and eighty seven. Right. And because of that, I mean, they've right. been able to avoid that exactly. ever since. Exactly. Great stuff, Wade. Great yeah, it stuff, really is. Man. It's yeah. it's interesting perspective on, on the history, man. So, but but before we let you go, man, there, there was a story that was told here in the tank a few weeks ago. <laughs> we had one of the great characters of all time that have that have been a part of this franchise, and Bobby Monica, right? Who was your equipment manager? Yep, right. Absolutely. And uh, Bobby was telling a story about a run in he had with Coach Shula. But the funniest part about it, you know, he says a player hurt himself cutting off tape. And uh, actually was using the tape cutters to cut off the tape on mm-hmm. the on his wrist, mm-hmm. and ended up taking a shot on his nose. You know, Do you know what? who that player was. You know what? That was <laughs> that was yours truly. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember after a game, and I used to tape my wrist up. You know, you know, tape the, the, for support, and you know, also I thought it looked good. You know, you yeah, look good. You play damn good. right. So Corner you know, so I yeah. I used to always used a tape cutter and cut toward my wrist. But for some reason, the tape had gotten rolled up near the top of my forearm, and I couldn't get it. So I said, let me just do it from the other way, from the wrist and go up. So I <laughs> cut it and cut it, and it was a little hard. And I looked, I said, what is cutting? What is holding this thing 
boom, it cut through and cut me on the nose. Oh, man. And it was bleeding badly. Oh, oh. that thing is and, sharp. Oh, that thing They're starts sharkish. shooting out oh. blood and... And everybody was, ah, you know, that kind of, <laughs> and Bob, and, and, and it was a lot of commotion. And I guess Shula said something to, to Bobby Monica. And then, uh, you know, nobody laughed until they found out I was all right. My nose stopped bleeding. Yeah. And I had to get a couple of stitches there. But that was something that Bobby still talks about, obviously. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> well, he said, you screamed like oh, a stuck man. pig, man. And, oh, and Shula man. thought it was him. <laughs> Who's talking while I'm talking? Right, <laughs> right. Who's talking? <laughs> that's that's him. Oh man! Now, oh, what, did he say he went into the shower and it looked like a, a oh, blood man, bag? It, it was bad, and uh, yeah. God, yeah, I'm glad you're all right, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, can't yeah, tell yeah. now, so it healed up pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Who stitched you up? They did a hell of a job. Oh man, they, you know we had our team doctor. He was right. there. So, oh so, so, yeah, we, we've heard some of those stories too, man. Well, what a pleasure to to sit down with you and spend mm-hmm. some time with you. And um, as I said, I mean these are. I, I remember watching these teams. Mm-hmm. But to hear these stories are really, really cool. Yep. Man, Absolutely. thanks for diving in, William, man. Hey, thanks for having me, and I look forward to maybe the next time. That's right. Got to get you back. Right, okay. Now right. you're family. Great right. stuff, bro. Thank you. All right, William. Thank you. So long. You're now diving into the fish tank. Sitting down with Seth living, Seth. OJ, Juice, Juice Man, ooh, and this is strictly for them true fans, yeah. dog fans, number one, one, of course y'all, this ain't no ordinary sports talk, dive up in that fish tank, go get your aqua orange, yeah, it's time to dive up in that fish tank, it's only legendary talking when you dive up in that fish tank, rocking with OJ and Seth when you dive up in that fish tank, uh-uh. Uh-uh. Okay, this one for them diehards Celebrate big or cry hard Leave it all on the field, we gon' try hard Old school, a new school, mix it in Feeling like we up close when we listening Dolphins tales, in Miami is the deep end We vibing with our favorite players, no secret We get with Seth and McDuffie Bringing up stories we never heard to the public Bet we love it, Dolphins fans never budget We loyal to the team, whether happy or we upset We be like, what's next? Don't switch the subject You know it's all about them fans And if you ready for that water, time to dive in Don't switch the subject, you know it's all about them fans And if you down with Dolphins Nation, time to dive in Don't switch the subject, you know it's all about them fans You looking at that fish tank, it's time to dive, dive in fish tank Go get your aqua orange, yeah, it's time to dive up in that fish tank It's only legendary talking when you dive up in that fish tank Rockin' with OJ and Seth when you dive up in that fish tank Don't ever add a tool, you better dive up in that fish tank